lap. So. <laughs> It's not so hot for me either. I, but there's a there's there's a bass trap. If you're behind the stacks here, back there where I should be, it's like Victor Bono is just squatting on your head every on the twos and the fours. And it doesn't relent. So I'm out here peacefully, no pain. But you know.
mold that doesn't do that for us. We'll see how that did.
what? It, it's a really, it's a really weird setup. I don't know what. Uh, I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Uh, you know, you, you you start when you start playing, you, you're trying to blow your, you know, you're, you're trying to blow your own mind. You're trying to get off. Something about whatever instrument you got sucked into is not letting you go, and you you have to find things in there. And when you do, you just go nuts, and you play it for the rest of your life, basically. And uh, uh, but after a while, if this happens, if it turns out to be your your job, you have to learn to play with dispassion. In other words, I can't really blow my mind anymore when, when I'm up there. I just did that on that last tune. <laughs> I was getting really in there. Oh man, is that gooey? That's really nice. This and that. This is that. You know, they, you know, you forgot. You just went off on that last vibrato or something. It's cruel. It's just cruel. That, I mean, you know, notice a lot of musicians their face looks like stone when they're playing either that or it just looks horrible because they're playing with their face you know and they signal every note when i was a kid i would i, I, I could sneak into a place called the showboat lounge in washington dc because the drinking age there was 18 and if you were 16 that was good enough for them and uh the guy who checked ideas at the door was bent at a 90 degree angle at his waist, and I'm not making that up. It was 90 degrees. I don't know how he pulled that off. I suppose it's like everything else we do. You have no choice. There's no option. If I can't go on. I must go on. We'll go on. Why does that go? And, um, and I would go there after a while to see, because it was owned by a guitar player, Char the club, Charlie Bird. And he would, he would book a lot of guitarists in there, and I'd go down to see these people, Kenny Burrell, I remember especially well. And they would have a pickup band, which included a drummer named Buddy Deppenschmidt, who's still working, and he played with his face every single note. <laughs> There was this painting above it, this animated display, which is mostly one filled with disgust. It just didn't please him what he was doing. He blew his mind in a sort of backward way, and it was, it was a ball to watch it. But after a while, so I remember him. I try not to play with my face. I've been told that I do. Especially if I screw up. Somebody said, you're, you look like you're in pain. Well, I am in pain. I'm in there, you know what? Excuse me. Did I yell? I played last night in uh, Beacon, New York. When I first met Pete Seeger, he, I asked him for his phone number, and he drew me a map to his house. <laughs> things instrumentally that nobody else did. That's one of his, uh, one of my favorite tunes.
most of us live on the earth. <laughs> first guy to meet me when I got off the bus was Doc Watts, of all people. And I, I was opening for him at the Zellerbach Auditorium in Berkeley. Uh, I was very nervous about this. And I was doing the sound check and uh, standing up there trying to get a sound. And I felt a presence here. And, and an arm reached up and grabbed my, my low E string here. And he said, this gear heard. Doc saying, your low E is flat. <laughs> first words he spoke to me. <laughs> and after this, every now and then, we wind up at festivals or we do, uh, you know, we'd have a bill together somewhere. And some years ago, I don't know how long ago, but in uh, Keene, New Hampshire, we were in the dressing room waiting to go on. It was this really nice old theater there. I was fussing around with the guitar. He said, boy, that sure sounds good. Mm -hmm. So I handed him the guitar, and the first thing he did was sharp the low. <laughs> <laughs> 35 years later, I was still flat. <laughs> Associating there a little bit, going off to Guiltville, I'm flat, I'm flat. Actually, where I went was another guitar player that I got to meet. Um, and I have to preface this by saying I recorded a song that I should have probably left off the record. Not, you know, not knowing any better, I left it on the record. It was, it was during the time that the contract stipulated when you would turn the record in, which the beginning was every six months, so you put some stuff on there that you wouldn't otherwise put on, just so that you didn't get sued, put this in there, or whatever. So the president would show up at the front door. And uh, I, I, uh, this may be one of them, but uh, uh, Billy Peterson and I, now known as Willard Peterson, uh, were fooling around in the studio. We liked what happened, and I decided to recite uh, some brilliant thing that I dreamed of about a woman who lived in a bus a guy picks her up takes her out past the you know on the, over the overpass where you hear the space in the crew room <laughs> usually I know what that is <laughs> I'm disturbed <laughs> and they've been in there, in and out, for 25, 30 years. SM-58 has been around since World War II. So, there's been a lot of people on these microphones. A lot of blues players, a lot of jazz players, a lot of folkies. And they, you know, God knows what's happened to these microphones. <laughs> And you come up here, and you're supposed to stay on the mic like this. This is my technique. I stay on it, but above it, so that I can't repeat what happened to me one night, which is when I was down here, I was singing, and a hair insinuated itself between my front teeth, and I, you know, you recoil. And the mic came with me. serious. And I, I can't, you know, I can't have your normal reaction. I have to keep singing. I mean, I'm on it because I'm singing. So the, this guy picks her up. He goes, you go, there's the spaces in the overpass, and they drive by the cigarette butts on the side of the road, go down a dusty road past the country's out to its house. 
get out of the guy's truck and he says, you want to come in and have, I don't know what he said, but he did. We know he's going to drag her off into his shit there. And uh, I thought, well, what do I do now? I've got this much, I can't afford to lose this. This is so fascinating. And uh, she, so I, she just said, well, okay, sure. And he extinguishes his cigar on his dog. And she gets, I thought that was, isn't that smart? It's called creativity. And uh, uh, she said, what, you know, we don't have to hear what she said. She said, take me back to the bus. So we drove her back to the bus, past the country, the dirt and all of that. And she's sitting in the bus. And then hours later, the moons are on, whatever's going on, back down the spaces, the overpass, the countries, the cigarette bus, the dust, the dog bursts in the flame. <laughs> That's when I thought I had a hit. <laughs> your best intentions are your worst enemies. Your own judgment is something you should never trust. Because it changes every day. Maybe I'm only speaking for myself. Um, now I had to tell you that because years later I'm playing uh, Humphreys in San Diego. I'm done, it's an outdoor job. I'm walking off and Barney Kessel is standing out in the crowd. And I looked at him, I walked up to him and I, I told him who he was. <laughs> He said, yeah, and then he said, did, did, you, uh, did you grow up in Muskogee? I said, for four years I did. He said, so did I. Damn. And this is Barney Kessel, who was a bop pioneer on guitar. He said, I learned to play guitar there in Muskogee. Okay. He said, I learned from a Hawaiian lap steel player being paid by the WPA. He was a, on a work thing. Or in the new deal. I couldn't put this together. I mean, really complicated, sophisticated, sophisticated or sophisticated. And I'm, so I'm kind of baffled, I'm dazzled, I'm enchanted. I'm talking to Barney Kessel, and we both lived in Muskogee. I lived in, and I noticed this little girl over here. Now, this is, you know, like, like I don't know, midnight or something. She was about. I can't, I don't know how, how you can tell. I, this is about eight years old, let's say. She was standing there like, like this. It's that look, you know, that tells you, pay attention here. And I, and I thought, I can do this. I said, hello. Excuse me, Mr. Cut, hello. And she looked at me and she said, why did the dog have to burn? <laughs> Associated again. It's Mr. Asshole to you. I didn't know what to say to her. Plus, Barney is standing there. Who did I, you know? Oh, well. I think I know what I would say today. The dog had really long hair. A lot of fleas, bugs, parts of screen doors in that hair. A little fire is just what he wanted. It was a pact, a symbiotic relationship between the owner and the canine. But you're too young to know this. I made an assumption. It's all your fault, little girl. That's what I want to tell you.